Good afternoon, everybody. I see that it's 1 p.m., so we'll get started here. Welcome to our inaugural session of the webinar series, Co-Designing the Active City. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, this is the first in a series of three webinars. And as the title suggests today, we will demonstrate how participatory urban planning can foster the development of built environments that favor health in Canadian communities. I wanted to start by thanking you all for your interest in the project and in the webinar series. The Active Neighborhoods Canada team is pleasantly surprised to see the enthusiasm for these webinars. And so on behalf of our entire team, I want to say thank you for being here today. So briefly, our mission today is to help you understand the impacts of urban planning on health and equity and the importance of using a participatory co-design approach in achieving the most equitable outcomes in our built environments. Um, a little bit about me. My name is Francis Nasca. I am a project manager with the Center for Active Transportation, and I'm the evaluation coordinator for the National Active Neighborhoods Canada project. Um, my background is that I have a Master of Arts in Sustainability Studies, where I did research looking at um, how to improve equity in planning processes and how this results in outcomes that um, meet the need, better meet the needs of marginalized communities. To give you a little bit of background on the Active Neighborhoods Canada project itself, Active Neighborhoods Canada is a partnership between three Canadian organizations the Montreal Urban Ecology Centre, the Centre for Active Transportation, which is based in Toronto, and Sustainable Calgary. Together, we've worked for about 10 years to develop, pilot, and share approaches to co-designing active neighbourhoods. So we work with communities to um, engage residents and professionals together in building neighbourhoods that support walking, cycling, and other means of active transportation for everyone by providing safe and welcoming urban design. Our approach is situated at a kind of unique crossroads. We look at the relationship between health, equity, and the built environment, and how participatory urban planning can influence each of these things. Um, so the plan for the webinar today, um, we'll start with a section about citizen participation, explaining um, what citizen participation is and why it's important to um, involve people in diverse and varied ways in planning processes. We'll then look at how participatory urban planning has an impact on health. And here we'll use a case study from Laval, Quebec uh, to illustrate the transformation of an environment in favor of the health of the residents. The fourth section will focus on participatory urban planning and its impacts on equity. And to get you um, started with a clear idea of how the participatory urban planning approach can build equity, I'll present two case studies. One is from Toronto and one is from Montreal. Um, so we'll take about 45 minutes to do all of that and then we'll proceed to a Q&A section, which will be about 15 minutes. Um, so for the Q&A session, um, it's, We'll address the answers to your questions orally at the end of the session, but you're able to ask questions all throughout the session using the chat box in your GoToMeeting platform. Um, so around 1.45, I'll stop presenting and reserve 15 minutes for the questions. Um, don't hesitate to ask a question. Um, if you do have trouble with the tech side of things, the audio or visual side of things, um, my colleague from the Montreal Urban Ecology Center is also on the line and she will address those questions as we go. It's worth noting also that the webinar is being recorded and the presentation, all of the sources we've used in the Q&A will be archived on our website, which is participatoryplanning.ca, right after the broadcast. And so if you know anyone who couldn't attend the session today or you wanna to refer to it at a later date, all of the content will be available here. And if by chance we don't have time to address all of the questions, we'll respond to them in text on our website. Okay, with all of that housekeeping out of the way, I wanted to move into our first kind of section of content here. Let's start with a discussion on citizen participation. As a decision maker or a planner or other professional working in the built environment, um, it can sometimes be difficult to understand how to undertake meaningful citizen participation. 
Um, so in this section, we'll look at what does good citizen participation look like? Where do we start? Who should we involve? When and how? Um, and we'll try to demystify these questions during this section. So first, it's important to ask yourself why citizens would want to get involved. Um, the answer to this is quite simple. Citizens want to be heard. But there's also another side to that. The information that citizens have is really valuable to us as um, professionals. People experience daily problems, frustrations in their communities, and they also know what the assets and strengths are in their communities to build upon. Um, they have dreams that they want to achieve for their neighborhood, and this is a cause that can really matter to them. So in short, any reason for a citizen to get involved is a good reason. So I wanted to start um, this section by framing six key principles of our co-design approach, and we'll keep these in mind throughout the session. The first is that residents are experts. So as I mentioned in the slide previous, people really do carry a specific and valuable set of knowledge um, related to their experience of living, working, and playing in their communities on the day-to-day -day basis. And this expertise can really enrich planning outcomes. We also believe that participation builds equity. So when certain communities or voices are marginalized from the process of participating, um, this often results in built environment outcomes that further leave these communities out. So if, for example, somebody faces barriers to attending a traditional open house style consultation session, um, then those people's voices aren't heard and their needs aren't taken into consideration. So equity, equity has to be built right from the ground up. We also believe that planning can be fun. Um, it doesn't have to happen in those really formal settings. We spend a lot of time going out into communities to places where people already live and work and play and gather, um, doing pop-ups, going into schools and retirement homes, hosting barbecues and street parties, and finding uh, a lot of different ways for people to contribute their knowledge and expertise. We also believe that combining knowledge creates strong outcomes. So although residents are experts, um, all of us that are here on the webinar today are likely also experts, whether that's experts in urban planning, urban design, uh, transportation planning or engineering, architecture or public health. And bringing all of these knowledge sets together leads to stronger outcomes. We believe that collaboration is key. Um, so this relates to the last one, but it also relates to how we structure our projects and community. So when we're getting started in any given community, we start with uh, forming an intersectoral advisory committee that includes people from across different sectors. It includes residents, municipalities, community organizations to all work together on uh, the co-design process. Last but not least, we believe that community plans are living documents. Um, so the plans that we come up with in community, um, you know, sometimes are tied to direct implementation and sometimes are a longer term vision um, that can serve as an advocacy tool for residents to work towards the changes that they want to see um, and that can serve as a foundation to articulate what a healthy environment would look like in that community. And these are living documents that can grow and change, um, have pieces implemented at different points along the way. Um, so. Why bother engaging with citizens? Um, beyond the fact that many of us are obviously required to, there are some very practical and tangible benefits that come from the involvement of citizens. Um, as I mentioned, citizen participation can combine knowledge. It can supplement the technical knowledge of urban design professionals by informing them about the day-to-day -day use of the area. This helps us to prioritize the needs of specific populations and target specific locations or communities um, for planning interventions. It also helps to build community ownership of a project, enhance community buy-in, and promote the adoption of a project by its community. And we've seen this play out in our work on the ground, but it's also reflected um, in the literature. So in this vein, in an article written in the Community Development Journal by Natasha Blanchet-Cohen, um, she writes that residents need to be involved in shaping their neighborhoods because they hold knowledge that is qualitatively and quantitatively different from that of urban planners. Um, so they are indeed the people that need to be involved because they really are the ones, the only ones that know what is good for them and what is not. Um, so to move on to, um, now we know why to involve citizens, and let's move on to the how. So a few ground rules for how to make citizen participation um, inclusive. 
The very first is that we must start with the idea that um, planning professionals don't come forward to the a community with a project that's basically finished before public consultation begins. I think many of us have unfortunately seen this happen where by the time citizens are involved, there's a relatively complete plan that's put before them. Um, we think that it's not necessary to ask everyone's opinion at all, all the time, at all the points throughout the process, but rather to find multiple oppor opportunities and mechanisms to engage diverse voices. Some people will have many, many hours to contribute and will want to get um, involved in in-depth workshops or design charrettes, and others might need a way that's faster and easier, a little bit more nimble for them to share their views on the neighborhood. Um, of course, although you don't have to involve everyone's opinion all the time, it is really important to do engagement that specifically reaches out to communities that may typically be left out of planning processes. This could include immigrants, the elderly, um, young people, people experiencing poverty, um, and any other um, you know, so, so, social or cultural um, factors that might make it more challenging for people to participate. Um, we want to make sure that there's opportunities that um, work for these communities and for all um, so that we can get as many voices as possible. Um, and of course, we um, suggest consulting people before the start of the project and all throughout and working to find solutions collectively. Um, so working to actually sit, sit down and have citizens and planners and designers uh, work together on finding solutions that meet the community's needs. Um, so how we do this within our process is uh, by following kind of a six stage uh, process, each of which is important to making sure that we get resident involvement um, and opinions contributed all throughout. The first phase is the launching phase. So this involves establishing partnerships with local and relevant actors to the project. Um, so this could include people that are empowered to make decisions like municipal elected officials and professionals. It could involve community organizations and of course citizens. Um, and this partnership or local stakeholder committee guides you all throughout the rest of the phases of the project. Then we move into an understanding phase of the project where we do a lot of really broad based engagement in the neighborhood to understand the built environment, um, to understand what really works well in the neighborhood, what are the assets to build upon, and what are the gaps in the uh, built environment and the social fabric in the area that could be addressed through design. Um, a few different tools that we use are things like exploratory walks, surveys, asset mapping, uh, observations, and we take all of this primary information and combine it with information from secondary sources such as large-scale surveys like the Canadian Census to create a portrait of the neighborhood. And you can view many of what these portrait documents look like, again, on our website. Then we move into an exploring phase where we identify possible design solutions that meet the needs of citizens and resolve the issues. So here we host a co-design workshop or a charrette between um, different diverse professions and citizens to work together on design ideas. Um, it's a really creative and visionary phase where people's dreams can kind of run wild. And then we move into a design, uh, I'm sorry, a deciding phase where we start to narrow down those solutions um, decide what are the priorities for residents and validate and improve the solutions developed. Um, so we have some um, work sessions and validation workshops with residents and from there we develop a vision document for the neighborhood. Step five is an acting phase and this basically means going on site and implementing some the solutions planned or some of the solutions planned with and for citizens. So activities in this phase can take many forms um, from you know, tree plantings or building community gardens to pilot um, traffic calming or infrastructure demonstrations to the permanent implementation of designs. Um, and some cases will implement the whole vision and in some will just get started with a few ideas that help us build towards that longer term vision. And the inaugurate phase, phase six, is really a celebratory phase. Um, it helps to celebrate the project's accomplishments, mobilize citizens, and help people to feel proud of what they've achieved in their neighborhood. So this is a very, um, you know, human and continuous process. It takes um, a little bit more resources and effort than a traditional consultation process, but 
every step is really crucial and it results in really strong outcomes we've seen in our projects and we'll show you some case studies in a moment. Um, so if you're interested in further digging into each phase of this process or learning more about it, I invite you to visit our website where you can find this guide, Participatory Urban Planning, amongst many other resources. Um, also on our website is a toolkit with a bunch of facilitation guides um, that show you how to facilitate each of the different activities that we might use within these phases of the project. So we'll cover some specific tools um, in depth in the next webinar, but in the meantime, I would explore you to look through. Um, we have over two dozen bilingual facilitation guides for different engagement activities that you can use. So moving on to the next section, I wanted to highlight how participatory urban planning and the built environment can impact health. Um, first, we'll start briefly with framing the issue of how the built environment impacts our health. So to situate you, in 2017, the Public Health Agency of Canada released some new um, data on obesity rates in Canada to encourage Canadians to adopt a healthier lifestyle. So although we know there are many factors that influence people's health, obesity is an underlying concern for several chronic conditions like heart disease, diabetes, blood pressure, high blood pressure, and more. So as we can see, we still have to fight against the rise of obesity in Canada. In fact, amongst adults, we went from a 49% obesity rate in, in 1978 to 64% in 2017. In children, we went from 23% to 30% in the same time. Fortunately, we do see an improvement in childhood obesity rates between uh, the years 2004 and 2017, but there's still some work to go. Um, and it's important also to note that in a report released by Participation in 2018, Canada was given um, a D plus for the overall health and physical activity uh, levels of youth. So we need to be finding ways to um, encourage people to make healthier behavior choices. And given the situation, health professionals um, believe that they can't really resolve the situation alone and that other key players can be part of the health movement. And this is where you can intervene by making urban planning decisions that support people to make healthier behavior choices. So as I'm sure uh, many of us are aware, there are many links between the built environment and health. And based on the data presented in the previous slide, um, the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada, Dr. Theresa Tam, decided in 2017 to write her report on the state of public health in Canada on designing healthy living. Um, so in this report, she looks at how the built environment, the external physical environment where we live, work, study, and play, provides a foundation for our health, whether that's for positive health outcomes or negative health outcomes. Um, so Dr. Tam argues that without being aware of it, our neighborhoods and how they are built influence how healthy we are. She suggests that if the built environment promoted active transportation, such as walking and cycling, it would help address the growing need for Canadians to be more physically active and to take better care of their health. Um, I didn't so, go on it. Oh, no. I'm sorry, I think we have a participant um, who too, might need to mute their microphone. Thanks. All right, so I will... Now look at why exactly we're struggling with health problems and decreased physical activity and how the built environment contributes to that in many ways. It's due at least in part to the rise of the automobile in the last decades and to the longer commute times and further distances between destinations. The automobile has really very rapidly changed the picture of mobility around the world and particularly here in North America. Of course, the flexibility and speed provided by the automobile have made it a really attractive option um, for people to use. And as a result of this, um, this has led to design, designing cities that also favored the car. Destinations are further apart, green space and infrastructure for cycling and walking are deprioritized, and this discourages people from being active. Automobile dependence doesn't just contribute to low physical activity levels. It also contributes to other health concerns, including respiratory issues linked to poor air quality, vulnerability to extreme heat linked to the presence of paved surfaces, vehicle emissions, and global warming, mental health concerns linked to the lack of green space and the stress of commutes, and of course, acute injuries linked to collisions. The automobile is in fact a very dangerous technology. 
So all of this means that we're building cities that are hindering rather than promoting health. But the good news is um, there's a flip side to that. The built environment can actually really benefit our health. Um, built environments that are not designed solely with automobility in mind can um, help to enhance health for all. So that's why investing in the built environment is a good way to have a major impact on the health of your population. The benefits are numerous and proven. Um, planning neighborhoods with certain features is more likely to encourage citizens to be physically active. For instance, mixed land use, density, connectivity, um, a variety of destinations, adequate pedestrian and cycling infrastructure, green space are all features that are favorable to physical activity. These features um, lead to a human response, which is often a change in behavior. People will become more physically active if you build them the infrastructure and features that support this. And the outcome of this, of course, is a reduced risk for health concerns like premature death, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, poor mental, met, sorry, mental health, and more. Um, to make sure we're all on the same page, let's just briefly define some of these features that favor active transportation to make sure they're well understood. First, mixed land use um, is defined by the presence of different activities um, or land uses within the same place. So that would include resident, residential and socioeconomic activities as the presence of offices, shops, institutions, public services, and parks. It helps to create a complete living environment where many uses can take place and where people can live, work, play, go grocery shopping, and meet all of their needs um, without having to leave their neighborhood. Compactness relates to this, but it also refers to the relationship between the built and underdeveloped um, environment. It's a way of limiting gaps and discontinuities between the built form, and this helps to create living environments that are both dense and friendly, uh, respectful to the human scale, and favorable to creating shorter distances of travel between destinations. Um, of course, you can have a community that is has mixed uses and is nice and compact, but if there's not good connectivity um, in the streets and sidewalks and cycling infrastructure, it can still be challenging for people to get around. So good connectivity means that streets allow for varied and continuous routes within the neighborhood and out of it. Um, and lastly, there's other uh, examples of good quality planning, such as providing well-maintained sidewalks with reasonable width and accessible curb, curb cuts, appropriate cycling infrastructure, uh, human scale lighting that's at the kind of pedestrian level, um, gr part providing greenery, furniture, benches, tables, and parklets. And if you consider all of these features in neighborhood design, and if they're combined and planned with citizens um, in the development of a neighborhood, and encourages residents to walk and bike and be active on a daily basis, not only in their recreational activities, but also by building physical activity in their day-to-day -day life. So this gives you kind of an example of what happens if you use some of these factors, but not others. Um, in this photo here, we do have a relative degree of compactness and density. However, there's no um, provision of infrastructure for cyclists and pedestrians, no connectivity, um, between the two different sides of this road. So even if you lived in this one apartment building on the right of the image, you would most likely choose to drive to get to those destinations on the left because there's no safe way for you to access those buildings. So it is really important that these features all be considered in tandem. Once again, um, these concepts are concepts that are very well proven in the literature. Um, the American Journal of Preventative Medicine tells us that providing new and sustainable transportation infrastructure is effective in creating an increase in active commuting. Uh, Jan Gell, Danish urban planner, reports that if all the new neighborhoods were built so that walking and cycling could meet the needs of daily transportation, a lot of health problems would be solved. And also, um, we learned from the Journal of the American Planning Association that if the built environment stimulates increased vehicular travel, this may increase per capita vehicle emissions and increase exposure to pollutants um, and the risk of respiratory and cardiovascular outlets. Um, and so it's taking these things into account is sort of what we tried to do in the city of Laval, Quebec, uh, which is the first case study that I'll go through with you. Um, 
So in this case study, um, we focused on the redevelopment of Le Crevasier uh, South Boulevard in Laval. And we aim to improve that um, central corridor for active transportation and public transit. So this boulevard was a traditionally commercial road designed for automobiles um, with multiple traffic lanes, three to four in each direction, as you can see in this picture. Um, the public transit agency there wanted to make it more attractive, comfortable, and safer for pedestrians, cyclists, and transit users. So instead of having this sort of internal highway through the middle of the city, um, we came up with this design through a co-design process with the citizens um, to increase the usable area for active transportation and public transit. In terms of pedestrian infrastructure, sidewalks have been widened. Um, regarding landscaping and furniture, trees have been planted to reduce heat islands, and the lighting system has also been improved. Um, in terms of cycling infrastructure, bicycle lanes were added to either side of the street, and these also serve as a bit of a buffer to protect pedestrians, which tend to be our most vulnerable road users um, from the vehicular traffic. And lastly, of course, um, there's some central lanes here that are reserved for bus rapid transit and have accessible transit shelters along the way. So here's what this looks like now in reality. Um, you can see that these elements have come to fruition um, and that there's much more space here dedicated to pedestrians and cyclists. Of course, this isn't perfect yet. Um, it's a work in progress. Certain features um, might not be met yet, such as the compactness of the community itself and the connectivity to other routes nearby. But I think we can agree that it's a first step forward in transforming this boulevard um, into one that is safer and more accessible for all users and mobility types. Ultimately, these improvements allow the current residents and will allow new ones to choose different mobility options and empower them to uh, make some behavior changes that may contribute to improved health. Um, so this example is uh, what we call a complete street or a street that's designed for all ages, mobilities, and modes of travel. Um, for more examples of this type, I wanted to point you to another website to check out. It's called Complete Streets for Canada. It's uh, developed and curated by the Center of Active, for Active Transportation, where I work. And this website finds multiple projects, case studies, complete streets, policies, and more from all across Canada. So there's a lot of exciting transformations that you can view that look uh, similar to the one in Laval, but that respond to a lot of different geographic um, contexts and transportation needs. Um, now that we have a general understanding of the impact of urban planning on health, I want to look at how this all relates to equity. Um, so to frame this, we will start with gaining a shared understanding of what equity means. Um, in fact, it's the fair and impartial allocation of resources based on the needs of the population. Um, so it's not about giving everybody access to the same exact things, but rather access to the same opportunities. Um, to illustrate this, as you can see on the top image here, um, we've given everybody the same bike, but it's really only a comfortable bike for one of the people. Um, this could be considered an equality approach of giving everybody the same. Um, an equity approach, rather, analyzes the needs of each individual and adapts the bike according to these needs so that in the end, everybody can enjoy the same opportunities. So um, within participatory planning, Equity starts in the process, it, process itself. It starts um, with really analyzing the needs of all of the different populations so that we can come up with these solutions that meet these needs. Um, so when we look at which communities we engage in the participatory process, of course we want to hear all voices, but we um, in particular will take an approach that tries to involve people that experience vulnerability. Um, but a vulnerable population is one that's at elevated risk of suffering harm as the result of um, a lack of different travel choices, living in built environments that uh, don't support their mobility, and more. Um, so regarding vulnerability, it's important to understand um, that this is a really complex and uh, intersectional concept. Um, 
It can involve biological traits like age and physical or psychological disability, social traits like race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual identity, and then traits uh, related to the physical or environmental um, places in which people live, including unsafe housing and incomplete transportation systems. And these factors all kind of play together. So oftentimes when a person is facing one of these vulnerabilities, um, they may be experiencing others as well. Um, it doesn't automatically mean that one is necessarily in a vulnerable um, situation if they experience one of these factors. Um, it is also impacted by the environment in which they are born um, that determines somebody's vulnerability. But all of these traits are really um, powerful factors that influence people's experience, both in their built environments and their ability to participate in planning processes. Um, so to, illust to illustrate, sorry, how um, vulnerability relates to the built environment and to health, I wanted to walk through a couple of case studies. Um, one has to do with heat islands and vulnerabilities in the city of Montreal. So in concise terms, a heat island is a built up area that is hotter than nearby rural areas. Um, this can happen from surfaces composed of asphalt, concrete, or tar, such as parking lots and shopping malls. Um, and heat islands are not just a downtown phenomenon, they can also form in residential neighborhoods and suburbs. And according to Montreal's Regional Public Health Department, the people most vulnerable to heat are the elderly, low-income households, people that are socially isolated, those suffering from chronic diseases or mental health conditions, and um, obviously um, those living in urban heat islands. But we also find that these, uh, these folks that experience these other vulnerabilities are more likely to live in neighborhoods that are experiencing heat islands or extreme heats. Um, so we realize here that the living environment does have a major impact on the health of vulnerable people. Um, so this map um, shows that vulnerable people living in urban heat islands are almost twice as likely to die during an extreme heat event. event. Um, so this is through, once again, the public health, uh, Quebec, sorry, Montreal Regional Public Health Department conducted this study, finding the statistic that vulnerable people are twice as likely to die during an extreme heat event. Um, so there are a lot of ways that we could reduce heat islands and improve health outcomes for vulnerable people. These can include things like reduction of concrete areas, increases in the amount of green space, tree plantings and urban greenings, adoptions of um, regulations that support enhanced greening and, and whatnot. But um, it's important, as I mentioned in the citizen engagement process, to work with the people that actually live here and experience these environments to understand how and where and why we apply these interventions to make sure that we're starting with understanding their needs and building up from there. Um, I wanted to put forward another case study to illustrate how inequity um, is reflected in our built environment. And this one relates to pedestrian collisions and vulnerability. Um, so the map that we see here um, is from some research that we undertook as the Active Neighborhoods team, mapping pedestrian collision rates alongside income in Calgary. And it shows that there are indeed glaring inequities in the number of collisions between vehicles and pedestrians in poorer neighborhoods. Um, so in Calgary, although pedestrian um, collisions occur all throughout the city, uh, most of them happen to occur in the northeastern part of the city, which is where Calgary's lowest income communities are located. And also, as I mentioned, um, there's a lot of intersecting factors, and this also happens to be um, one of the areas with the highest proportions of new Canadians in the city. Um, so as you can see on this map, the red circles um, show the frequency of collisions, um, and the shade of blue shows the income. So a lighter shade of blue is a lower income area, and we can see that those large red circles overhang the light blue areas showing that pedestrians are at higher risk um, for collisions in low-income areas. We don't just find this in um, Calgary, we find this also in Montreal. This study in Montreal showed that on average there are 6.3 times more pedestrian and vehicle collisions at intersections in the low-income uh, neighborhoods relative to the wealthier census tracts. And um, in Toronto, according to a report from Toronto Public Health, 
um, intersections in the downtown area, which are um, a wealthier area, um, that are also have high numbers of pedestrians, have much fewer collisions per capita than the low income areas um, in the suburbs. So once again, um, involving those that are affected in the decision making process can reduce, reduce the risk of collisions on a specific area. It can help to find context appropriate solutions to issues that we might not have thought about before. It could include things like pedestrian uh, crossings, traffic calming, pedestrian islands, and more. Um, but there are multiple solutions and we just need to involve the right people in figuring out which ones are appropriate for those communities. And we also have to um, make sure that we're targeting investments and enhancements um, to those that are experiencing the most vulnerability and inequity in our communities. Um, targeting participatory planning processes um, and interventions that face vulnerabilities helps to ensure that the process builds equity. Another approach that the ANC team supports to reduce health inequities is to adopt a Vision Zero plan. Um, so I wanted to briefly cover that. It might be something that's of interest for you and your communities. Um, so the concept of Vision Zero originated in Sweden in 1997 as a road safety strategy based on the idea that no loss of life or serious injury is acceptable on the road. The principle shows that it's possible to improve the road safety record here um, in Canada by transforming the liver, living environments into safe, sorry, transform our built environments into safer living environments. Um, so with this, um, is going through a little bit of the Vision Zero plan in Toronto. Um, Toronto has seen an increase in traffic related fatalities, most notably in pedestrians, cyclists, and older adults. Um, and so to respond to that, Vision Zero Toronto um, strives to eliminate all loss of life on our roads by ensuring that relevant stakeholders are um, included in building the road network and that we um, keep in mind this vision that no loss of life is acceptable on our roads. Um, so reducing or ultimately eliminating deaths and serious injuries on your roads by implementing safe transportation conditions can be part of your municipality's missions as well. And if you're interested in learning more, um, you can learn more about the Vision Zero approach on our website, um, participatoryplanning.ca. In Toronto, there's a five-year action plan, and you can also learn more about that by visiting the City of Toronto's website. So in addition to developing streets and sidewalks um, that favor active transportation modes, the Active Neighborhoods Project also strives for equitable access to green space. So green spaces are defined as any area um, comprising of natural, semi-natural, or artificial green land, and they provide multiple benefits to different groups of people um, that live within the city. Um, there, this is one of many definitions of what green space can include, but it, it could be anything including schoolyards, public parks, playgrounds, woodlands, wetlands, uh, community gardens, even rooftop gardens, and more. Of course, we all know that these green spaces are so important, but there are also many inequities related to green space, and many urban populations do have insufficient access. Um, so the literature shows us that in Montreal, specifically the wealthiest um, and densest areas on the island have systemic access to larger green spaces and pedestrian and cycling paths to get there, um, which enhances their access to these spaces. So it's a shame that certain groups of people have access to the benefits that these green spaces provide, but others don't. Um, from a health view, there are actually many benefits to green spaces. Um, researchers have linked poorer green space access to higher rates of overweight and um, obesity, higher mortality risks. We've also seen that access to green space can provide stress reduction and psychological well-being. Um, and green spaces can also help to alleviate public health expenses in the context of an aging society by allowing our older populations to remain active um, later in life if there are green spaces that are nearby to their living environments. So in summary, planning access to green spaces can make a huge difference in the health of populations, especially vulnerable ones. So to highlight um, how we've worked with increasing access to green space in one of our projects, 
I'll turn now to a case study from the Thorncliffe Park and Flemington Park neighborhoods in Toronto. Um, we worked on this project um, several years back, and it was in some neighborhoods that are surrounding the Don Valley Ravine. Don Valley Ravine. Um, so Thorncliffe Park and Flemington Park are tower residential neighborhoods. They're lower income communities with many new Canadians in them, and they live um, right by the ravine, one of the largest ecological resources in the city that has some really great potential. But on the other hand, uh, the area is disconnected from the city and is difficult to access for the Im immigrant communities living nearby. Access to the ravine trail system um, is unsafe and it's poorly marked. Um, there's no accessible entrances. Uh, but the worn footpath here is evidence of a demand for access at this location. So in this project, um, TCAT, along with partner organizations um, and public health professionals, local decision makers, and of course many citizens, work together to propose solutions to provide better, safer, and more clearly marked access to this green space. Um, Professional workshops and community forums gave voice to citizens' con concerns, like this one, where a citizen mentioned the importance of gaining access into the ravine because of its um, importance and um, the, sorry, <laughs> this, the, this, re this resident quote here that highlights the importance of access to the green space. Um, so in the end, what came out of this participatory process are many recommendations um, developed by citizens and by TCAT. Um, so these include things like uh, a new sidewalk and crosswalk to gain easier access into the park, signage providing information um, that helps people understand the ravine trail system, and a paved area that suggests um, entrance into the park and provides accessible access. Um, these are all excellent recommendations that help to build accessibility to the screen space and alleviate isolation and issues of sedentary behavior. Um, but the final decision ultimately um, rests with the municipality to bring this all to light. But as I mentioned, there is the opportunity for um, staged interventions and citizen-led actions. And so one of the uh, citizen-led actions that happened at this site to help improve um, access to the green space was some community art and mural projects um, that helped to tie the neighborhood into the ravine and to facilitate um, access into that space just through making it friendlier and more inviting. And to highlight one more case study um, that, that um, relates to inequity and pedestrian accessibility to health facilities, we'll turn now to um, the a health institution in the Hoshaga Mazenouf um, area of Montreal. Um, so in the context of our aging society, it's, in clear, it's clear to us that health institutions will be increasingly used throughout the country. If amenities in the area are designed for automobile access only, some people might find their access limited. For instance, people that use active transportation, um, people that use wheelchairs, walkers, or other mobility devices, or people that age out of being able to drive. Um, this is exactly why we undertook a participatory process around the CLSC and Holchega Maisonneuve, a neighborhood in Montreal, um, aiming to prove pedestrian accessibility into this area. Um, during these site visit visits, um, citizens came together with members of our team, um, including many citizens who had reduced mobility, and made some diagnoses of the environment here. Um, what they highlighted were the inconvenience of the area, the traffic speed, the lack of greenery, um, the lack of spaces to protect pedestrians, and the inaccessibility of this major health institution. Um, so to solve these problems, the Montreal Urban Ecology Center um, made some recommendations along with residents, um, including establishing a traffic island on the Pine Nine Boulevard, a very busy boulevard right near the health institution, in order to provide some safety for pedestrians, installing crosswalks with countdowns in front of and beside the health institution, calming traffic um, by adding st speed bumps, installing benches and enhancing greenery around the institution. Of course, all of these measures are very necessary in an urban context as dense and walkable as Hoshaga, but they would also um, be necessary elsewhere in Ontario or in other provinces. 
Um, older people who no longer feel comfortable to drive or unable to drive, or people with reduced mobility, or people who just don't have access to a vehicle for other reasons, um, exist everywhere, and they need access to these key institutions as well. Involving them in decision making can help you reduce inequity and ultimately can help offer them amenities designed according to their needs. Um, so we're actually right on time. That was our last case study um, for the afternoon. So we'll now spend the next 15 minutes going through some of your questions and addressing the things that came up during the session. So again, on behalf of the entire ANC, ANC team, I wanted to just say thank you. And I will now um, exit this briefly for a moment so that I can see your questions. OK, um, so our first question to get us started is, um, have you done any work incorporating participatory budgeting into these processes? Gathering all of the ideas is great, but when it comes to making trade-offs to deal with reduced resources, so often much of this work gets sidelined. How do we best, oh, so that's our first um, question there. Um, and the answer to that is that yes, um, the Montreal Urban Ecology Center in particular has done quite a lot of work around participatory budgeting um, in the province of Quebec and in the city of Montreal and as it relates to these projects. Um, I do wish actually that one of my colleagues from the Montreal Urban Ecology Center was here to answer that question in a little bit greater detail. And I may refer it to Mikhail St. Pierre to provide um, a little bit more context when we upload the responses to these questions on our websites. Um, but it's something that we um, have experimented a little bit less directly with in our projects in Ontario, um, but we have a lot to learn from our partners at the Montreal Urban Ecology Center and how participatory budgeting approaches can be used to um, help prioritize these interventions and help citizens to um, understand the trade-offs that need to be made in designing communities and to empower them to make the choices uh, to choose the things that most are important to them. Um, so I will get a little bit better follow-up. I know it's not the most satisfactory answer, but I will see if I can get a colleague um, from the Montreal Urban Ecology Center to give you a little bit more detail. Um, the next question is how to invest, involve community in these trade-off decisions when the money piece is a major driving factor, so in the post-concept design. I actually think, now that I'm reading it, my apologies, I think that uh, related to the previous question. Um, so once again, I will have um, a little bit more follow-up on that from our colleagues in Montreal. I'll look now in the chat window and see if any more questions have come up. Okay, I'm just going to take a sip of water here. Okay, so the next question is, when including multiple stakeholders, including the public, how do you uh, balance different priorities and viewpoints? So e.g. considering evidence-based and population health versus individual convenience. Um, so I would say that what we do here is, um, first, like we start with getting a really comprehensive uh, view of the needs of the citizens before we move on to the solutions phase. So in that understanding phase, um, we really do give people the opportunity to help us understand what their needs are. Um, and at that point, we don't focus as much on um, what all of the possible interventions are so that um, people don't necessarily get their heart set on one idea or another. Then um, when we move into the visioning phase, we actually bring those residents together directly with people um, from the municipality, um, working in the private sector and planning and transportation and engineering and public health um, and a bunch of different sectors. And we find when they're actually sitting together to come up with a solution, a lot of those trade-offs can be made and negotiated um, right there in person. Um, it helps to break down those barriers of communication to an extent. So um, the citizens that are around the table are able to understand um, some of these you know, very complex, but also evidence-based interventions. And um, likewise, the professionals that are around the table can um, understand things from a little bit um, more individualized of a point of view and can see, uh, build a little bit more empathy with those residents. So we 
we find that like simply by um, having those discussions together instead of presenting citizens with designs that are already made and asking for their feedback, we can mitigate a lot of that upfront. Um, I hope that answers the question adequately. You can always follow up um, again in the chat box if I didn't cover it or answer it in the way that you had hoped. Okay, uh, so the next question is, was the private sector engaged in some of the examples from the presentation and how did you go about engaging them? What role did they play? Um, so since I'm speaking from the perspective of the Ontario projects, I can speak a little bit more to how we've engaged the private sector in our projects. Um, so at the co-design workshops that we host, we often have many representatives from the private sector, um, different consultancies and um, folks that are actually willing to give their time in many cases in kind to help to facilitate the process or contribute their expertise to the process. Um, the other way that in Ontario we've involved the private sector is that we've actually um, worked with some other um, consultancies and been subcontracted to do citizen engagement or support citizen engagement on their behalf. So if they are undertaking a certain project and they want to find some innovative ways to gain input from citizens, we have worked um, on a fee-for-service basis to develop and implement citizen engagement strategies in partnership with private sector partners. Um, so that would be all of the questions that I've seen so far. Um, we'll give maybe just one more minute to see if anybody adds something else to the mix here. I can't see if anyone is typing. Okay, well, seeing uh, no more questions at the moment, um, we'll conclude for the evening. And of course, if um, you have any questions that come up, um, I'm available via email, as well as my colleagues at the Montreal Urban Ecology Center and at Sustainable Calgary. And we will do our best to answer those questions and post them along with the webinar content on our website. Um, so before we um, sign off today, I really hope that you enjoyed the webinar today and that it will serve you well in the future. Um, today's webinar was a really broad kind of overview webinar. So we hope that you'll join us for our next few webinars where we dive into a little bit greater detail about our approach. Um, our next webinar that will be broadcast in English is um, on the key tools that we use in the co-design process. And that will happen on Wednesday, August 28th at 1 p.m. And the third English webinar in our series, um, which includes some inspiring projects and examples that have used co-design from across Canada um, and goes into some greater depth on um, how these projects have built health equity, will happen on Wednesday, November 6th, again at 1 p.m. Um, so if you've registered for these webinars already, you'll receive information about the next one. Oh, sorry. Um, if you're registered for this webinar, you'll receive information about these next ones via email. Um, and we invite you to also stay tuned via our newsletter and our social networks. And um, more details on those will be forthcoming. Um, so once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we will put a link immediately into the discussion box of an evaluation form on this webinar. We would really appreciate it if you could complete it. Um, this is a new series for us, and we really want to take that feedback into consideration um, and how we structure our next webinars and what content we present to you. Um, so I hope everybody has a lovely summer afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you at our next session.